what's most interesting is the emergence of a new consensus because you have like the Washington consensus, which is like the monetary policy of the US and the World Bank, the IMF. Then you have sort of the, let's say the Beijing consensus, which is like the new rise of like the Belt and Road and like the Chinese government's willingness to extend loans uh, to countries around the world. Well, now you have the Nakamoto consensus, okay? Because now you have the idea of let's actually adopt Bitcoin. So this happened in a country three weeks ago or whatever. So El Salvador said, no, we're going to go with the Nakamoto consensus. Okay, we're going to actually make Bitcoin legal tender in our country. It's pretty crazy. Welcome to the Gold Republic podcast. My name is Bart Brandt. And I'm Alexei Jordanov. In our weekly podcast, we invite guests from all over the world to get valuable insights into the emergence of a new monetary system through the lens of precious metals, cryptocurrencies, and other financial instruments. And we are live. Well, welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, so first off, obviously, um, I, I always I always like to ask like what what your inner fire is, what what basically brought you to the place and uh, the the sequence of decisions in your life into the present moment where you're sitting on that chair. Have you got the long story or the short one? Well, the short one we have a limited amount of time. Uh, it's, it could be like the tweet uh, bio times ten. Yeah, kind of the tweet. Um, <laughs> I spent ten years in human rights working for a human rights organization. And in 2017, I got I got very interested in in the money currency side of human rights and in Bitcoin. And for the last five years, I've been focusing on that very closely, the intersection of uh, Bitcoin, freedom, human rights, etc. So mm -hmm. that's that's what led me to to where I am today. Yeah. So you are uh, the chief strategist of the Human Rights Foundation. And uh, mm -hmm. we met at the Oslo uh, Freedom Forum, which is mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a Davos, but for uh, for like uh, freedom fighters and activists all around the world. Mm -hmm. And really a bunch of uh, uh, inspiring people had goosebumps like pretty much all the time. Um, what is there like a precise story in, in that just five years ago um, through a person that you know um, or like the people that you meet from all over the world uh, that led you to basically connect freedom to money? Many. Uh, every human rights activist has a money problem. Some of them have faced demonetization, meaning the government has basically said, hey, this money that you've used is no longer valid. You have a certain number of days or months to come and turn it in, and then it's going to be illegal for you to hold, and you have to take our new money. And that's when the government takes the haircut and they, they, they de devalue the currency and they steal money from you. Um, some have de dealt with debasement, where the government will just sort of rapidly inflate uh, the money supply without increasing... Uh, the amount of goods in the economy and uh, many, many countries have fallen that fate. It's very sad. It, it creates tremendous economic devastation for the population. Uh, many activists have faced um, closed bank accounts. So the government doesn't like what they're doing and they, they freeze their bank account. It makes obviously running their operations very difficult. Some activists have faced uh, censorship and deplatforming. So um, they, they get kicked off of PayPal or whatever, and, and they're no longer able to get donations or, or inco income. Um, and then some people are, are behind financial walls or barriers, like uh, either imposed by dictators like in China or imposed by foreign powers, like embargoes on people in Cuba or uh, Iran, Palestine. Um, so, you know, I would say that billions of people suffer under at least one of the things I've just mentioned. Uh, probably the vast majority of humans, um, only about a billion people, uh, about 1 billion out of the 8 billion some odd humans, um, live under a system that has both property rights with like liberal democracy and also like a reserve currency. So like a strong currency that other nations want to invest in. Um, it's a very small percentage of humans who have both of those things. So if you live in one of those countries, you're very privileged, financially privileged. And then, you know, you need to open your eyes to what it's like for everybody else. Mm. Um, well, just to sum it up, of course, it's it's kind of like uh, being on the big monopoly board and you're not deciding where basically you're you're born into and you're given the passport and the currency and those are basically the, the two things that you need to basically carry along in your life or that change throughout mm -hmm. it, depending on how the game of the rules change. Um, just to sum it up, um, and this is more from a f maybe philosophical perspective, um, how is money a vehicle towards either or a tool towards uh, freedom or coercion? It is an instrument of liberation, but it's also, as you say, an instrument of oppression. Um, fiat money systems 
are designed to give the government control over the population. Um, a small group of people can turn a dial and introduce more money in the system or remove money from the system. Uh, they can make that currency weaker or stronger. Um, and this is done, you know, without asking the, the people of the country. You know, this is done in a way, even in democracies, that is not not sort of voted on, right? Uh, this is uh, a small group of people trying to do their best, it, you know, if we're to be generous about it. And, you know, that's what you might say the ECB or the Fed or the Bank of Japan does. Um, but that would be a very generous interpretation of what they're doing. I mean, a lot of times what happens is they're bailing out failed enterprises and banks and things like that. And in the meantime, not doing very much for the average person. So there's like huge inequalities that come out of this system, huge, huge inequalities that come out of the system. Um, and in authoritarian regimes around the world, I mean, it's way worse. I mean, it, it's it's basically like the government exists to sort of steal um, from from the population uh, and, and to loot them. And, and there's still foreign powers doing this as well. So money can also be a liberation tool, though, in the form of Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, we can fight back. People can opt into a currency that has no monetary policy that can be changed by governments. It's set in stone through math, through the creator Satoshi Nakamoto, and upheld by user control by people around the world who run full nodes, um, who get to decide what version of Bitcoin to run, uh, and they can verify all the transactions from cheap technology at home. So with Bitcoin, we have like the people's money, we have an escape and people around the world, uh, anyone who has internet access can, can, can start getting involved and they are right now and it's a big revolution. So that's what's happening. Mm. And it's an interesting post you have in the back. It's a separation of money in the states. Um, and nowadays mm -hmm. we see a convergence of both actually. So central banks who are supposed to be independent from any kind of uh, meddling into politics or policies in general seem to actually more and more take over the role of government-like uh, mandates, uh, as we see in the, 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 the United States of America, the Fed itself is, in one of its mandates, actually uh, there to uh, ensure low uh, unemployment. Uh, and sure. we see also more and more uh, power given into their hands. The ECB is the same thing. Panetta actually just recently uh, issued and said that actually fiscal and monetary policy should be and Uh, and could be the same thing. Uh, so clearly there is a, a shift of convergence, not only of technology and other layers of, of society, yeah. but in the role itself that's basically keep those check and balances. Um, what do you think is, let's say, the most important part in that to understand like those kind of mechanics of the different bodies? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, in the 1940s, uh, the US government merged its sort of fiscal and monetary policy and And, you know, the central bank essentially and, and the treasury, you know, work together, right? Um, and that's going to be probably what happens in the future in most countries. Uh, there will be no more like, quote unquote, independence of a central bank. Like the governments will just sort of have control over monetary policy. Um, and this is what happens in dictatorships, of course. There is no independence of the central bank. Look at Turkey. I mean, Erdogan basically gets to decide how much money gets printed. Uh, but through modern monetary policy, which is becoming very popular in America, and I think we'll probably end up taking over Europe as well, um, is this sort of uh, zeitgeist economic uh, idea that, uh, you know, essentially we don't have to have a limit on our spending and governments should just print money to address unemployment, uh, to, you know, provide s subsidies, um, to, you know, uh, help pe bail people out as well as corporations. Um And, and that's going to get a lot of attention and it's, it's starting to become part of policy uh, in, in many countries here. So I think we're heading in this direction of more and more sort of mon modern monetary theory in the fiat system. And look, we'll see where that goes. I mean, that's a huge social experiment. Uh, I don't know where that's going. Uh, my, my gut says it's not going to go in a great direction. Um, but guess what? We have like a plan B. So a as the governments are going to pursue this more like kind of like Hey, let's just have less restraints on what we're doing here. Let's 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 just be loose with our policy. We have plan B. So like it's kind of a natural check. So they want to like inflate the hell out of the dollar. Great. That's going to make our Bitcoin more valuable. So as long as citizens realize this, um, they can start saving into Bitcoin and it, it doesn't like 
you're, you're hedged against whatever the government does. If the government somehow figures out a policy that like strengthens the dollar or strengthens your currency, okay, well, maybe your Bitcoin will lose some value, but then you're, you're okay over on this side of things. So it, this gives us a plan B, which is very important because in the history of fiat currencies, they all have declined over time. Every single one of them has declined over time. So here you know, with Bitcoin, we have a currency that appreciates value over time. So it's a very important kind of parallel economy and something that everybody should understand, regardless of how connected or wealthy they are um, or, or how unconnected and, and you know, less, uh, you know, less resource uh, gifted they are. They should understand this and, and try to take advantage of it. Mm hmm. Um, on, on that precise note, so um, we'll come on Bitcoin like a bit later on. But first, I would like to first like put the, the foundation of what we just talked about before. Um, in, in a way, uh, it, could it be that the, the current monetary system in which uh, we are in is then mm -hmm. uh, some sort of... So we point fingers on China, North Korea, even Russia or other authoritarian countries about the way they restrict things and freedom. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. the US is sanctioning countries as it likes and how it likes, if it's Iran or even Russia or others, and always is a prerequisite to war or other things. Things are getting on different levels. Could we say that in one way or another, it's also some, some form of monetary warfare and, and, and also... If I put it really bluntly, a uh, dictatorship. Uh, well, yeah, so there's there's definitely monetary warfare. Um, the U.S. government, uh, you know, worked uh, assiduously uh, after World War One and World War Two to centralize monetary power over the rest of the world. This was manifested in the Bretton Woods Agreement. And um, they were tasked with like upholding the world's currency. Uh, peg to gold. They eventually could not sustain that peg due to uh, kind of the guns and butter warfare welfare state in the 70s with regard to the Vietnam War and the sort of sort of a uh, great society social welfare programs in the United States. So in 71, Nixon closed the gold window, prevented foreign banks from uh, foreign countries from redeeming their dollars into gold, um, the dollar began to inflate a lot uh, and depreciate. Um, and by about 18 months later, summer of 73, the dollar had lost 20% of its value versus um, other currencies. So, you know, these other countries that were worried about the dollar, they were right and, and the dollar did devalue. Um, but to save the dollar uh, and make and sustain its primacy, uh, the US dollar, the US government adopted the petrodollar standard. They signed a bunch of deals with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia basically agreed as the head of OPEC, uh, the swing producer of OPEC, the oil uh, exporting nations, they agreed to price all their energy sales in dollars. So this means that all these countries around the world would have to like get dollars to buy the oil. They couldn't just use their own, they couldn't just print their own currency um, to uh, buy oil anymore. Only America could do that. So if you're in Russia or you're in China or wherever, like you'd have to like literally dig the oil out yourself or, or like go buy it like with dollars. So it gave a huge advantage to the United States in foreign policy um, and has powered us ever since. And after we defeated the Soviets, where, where this played a big role, like this played a huge role, the petrodollar system. Um, we didn't have another Bretton Woods to like figure out how to make a fair world system. No, we just kept the petrodollar thing going. And anyone who tried to disrupt it, we would, we would, you know, we would definitely be aggressive with them. I think this is one of the main reasons uh, that we invaded Iraq. Uh, certainly, a big reason we 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 stopped Iraq from from expanding its presence in the Gulf in the early '90s. Uh, but also, I think for the the war in 2003, uh, to me, is pretty clear that the preserving the dollar system was kind of like at the core of this. So I think that, you know, the U.S. government has tried as much as it can to preserve dollar hegemony around the world. It uses that to, like, um, punish other nations, to sanction them, it uses its control over the system, over SWIFT, over the banks, over the IMF, over the World Bank, uh, to get what it wants around the world, to get this policy where, like, other countries have to import uh, our agricultural products, uh, even if it doesn't make sense, uh, where they have to import oil, even if it doesn't make sense. We've figured out a way to like get this going, but the system is like starting to collapse or at least unravel. Um, you know, it, it was sustained on this idea of like uh, foreign nations buying our debt 
uh, as kind of the reserve currency, the treasury bill system, basically, ever since the mid-70s. Um, and the Gulf nations, the Saudis, the Arabs, and then the Germans, and the Japanese, and the Chinese have all taken turns over the years being the primary buyer of our debt. Well, in 2013, the Chinese said no more, and no one else is coming to step in to be that next buyer. So the world has actually been like dishoarding treasuries or like getting rid of treasuries since then. So now the U.S. government is the majority buyer of our own debt. Okay, majority buyer of our own debt's the Fed. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we are losing influence and we don't have that hyper power status we used to have. Um, and we'll have to see where it goes from here. What's most interesting is the emergence of a new consensus because you have like the Washington consensus, which is like the monetary policy of the US and the World Bank, the IMF. Then you have sort of the, let's say the Beijing consensus, which is like the new rise of like the Belt and Road and like the Chinese government's willingness to extend loans. Uh, to countries around the world. Well, now you have the Nakamoto consensus, okay? Because now you have the idea of let's actually adopt Bitcoin. So this happened in a country three weeks ago or whatever. So El Salvador said, no, we're going to go with the Nakamoto consensus. Okay, we're going to actually um, make Bitcoin legal tender in our country. It's pretty crazy. So, um, so now you're going to see other countries try to do this. As an alternative, they're going to keep the dollar. I mean, right? But they're going to have Bitcoin as legal tender also. So you're going to start seeing other countries do this. And then there will eventually be political parties in these nations that are like single party, single, single issue parties where it'll be like the Bitcoin party. And it's like people are going to vote for the Bitcoin party as opposed to like the Republicans or Democrats or left wing or right wing or whatever. Um, you're going to start seeing that happen, too. So this was pretty huge. So so, yes, it's all about geopolitics. Um, and now there's a new game in town where it won't necessarily be U.S. or China as like the future reserve currency, but but maybe Bitcoin. Yeah, Alex, this is a great segue into the next question because, well, we see what the damages of the system where you could say uh, into in 03 where the United States invaded Iraq to preserve the dollar system. Um, so it's a, kind of an extended pretend uh, kind of system. And, and then again, you, we also see, for example, for example, what happened in El Salvador just a couple of weeks ago, where now Bitcoin is a legal tender. And the question would be, where are we? Because it looks like there is a, a global awakening or even a quickening in this awakening. So the question would be, what's your analysis? Is this real? Or would you say we are... Um, still in the beginning phase of, of the awakening to the system and, and all the people that it's left behind. No, it's happening. It's unstoppable. It's like a wave. Um, and we just get to watch it happen in our lifetime. It's, it's crazy. I mean, there, there'll probably be, there's very few um, monetary revolutions that happen. And up until this point, they've taken a long time because we, we didn't have a digital society. So, you know, gold took eons to, to gain its place as the store of value that's widely recognized as 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 something that was um, holding purchasing power. Uh, and over thousands of years, it, it reached its peak in the 1970s, obviously, in terms of value. But um, now now it's going to decline because people realize that Bitcoin is a better is a digital gold. It's better than gold in almost every way. Um, and you're going to see that 10 trillion dollar gold market cap get eaten over time by Bitcoin and surpassed by Bitcoin. It's going to happen in the next couple of decades. Um, so I think that it's happening. It's inevitable. Uh, it's happening really fast. It's faster than people think. So the so Bitcoin's growing faster than the internet. It's very interesting. If you look at the users, uh, 200 million users after 12 years. Um, I mean, we're going to be past a billion by 2025. That's what I think um, one way or another non-custodial, custodial, lightning, main chain, whatever. We're going to be at a billion people. And I, and I think maybe even more. I mean, eventually, I think most people will, will live in a country where they at least have the option um, to use Bitcoin. And I, I think Bitcoin will emerge as like a, uh, for certain uses, it was very popular. I think fiat currencies will still be around for a long time. And of course, governments will continue to issue debt. It's just, they're going to have to make that a little more enticing, right? So if you have Bitcoin, which has been averaging 200% on average per year, okay, rate of return. Why would you buy uh, Egyptian debt at 4%? No, you're, they're going to need, th that's going to need to be 20, 30, 40% for you to want to buy it, right? So 
I think it's going to change the, the the ability of nation states to 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 raise money, um, and they're going to have to rely on on taxes and on a better relationship with their citizens. And if they if those citizens aren't happy, they're just going to go somewhere else. So there's just going to be a lot less bullshit, I think, in the future. A lot less forever wars and war on drugs and all these nonsense things, surveillance states that don't actually help citizens, that just enrich a handful of people. There's going to be a lot less room for that stuff because governments are going to be more streamlined. They're going to have to be. Uh, the, the, the money that they can just magically print will be worth a lot less. And it'll be harder for them to raise money through, through foreign investors, through the sale of bonds. Uh, because not many, not as many people are going are gonna to want them, so it's going to completely change the global economy. I think for the better. It, I think it'll shift power back towards individuals away from, uh, away away from authoritarians. Um, so I think that's good. Well, follow up to that. Um, the one of the well, a lot of the disadvantages of the system are are visible and and increasingly increasingly f- visible. F- for a lot of people, so like social social stratification, and it all shows weaknesses. So the question would be: the elites that profit from this system, do they see it but ignore it? Do they um, do they not see it? Are they dumb, or are they perhaps blinded by greed and and therefore? only uh, benefit from the system and want to keep it in in place so why do these these elites keep this system in place seeing what the weaknesses are and why the stra- and, and what stratification it causes well because they benefit from it so in the case of the petrodollar system if you work in defense or technology or finance uh you're having a great time um, the percentage of GDP in America in the financial sector has risen from 10% to 20% in the last 30 years. Uh, if you're in any of those sectors, your your income has skyrocketed. And you've been able to invest back into through 401ks, stock market, stuff like that, real estate. Everything that you've bought as a coastal elite in the United States has skyrocketed in value, um, whether it be Amazon stock or your house in San Francisco or whatever. So if you're like an elite in one of these sectors, um, you know, not manufacturing, which has gotten wrecked, but like something like, again, defense or technology, investment, insurance, finance, banking, um, uh, you've been killing it, man, killing it. So so it's been really good for like a small percentage of the population and not great for the rest. OK, we have like, you know, average real wages are stagnant since the 70s. So the people in power have a sweet deal. Um, they're never going to give that up. That's never going to be something they give away willingly. It's going to have to be taken from them. And that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin. It's going to ruin their party. But policymakers, you would you would reckon, I, I think, uh, would be able to see what this social uh, what the social consequences are for their policies. So if they well, they all say that they have the best interest in mind for all of us. And still they do what these coastal elites, like you call them, what these coastal elites want them to do. Is that is that just a something, because it always turns around back on them. Is it something like we're just going to extend and pretend, delay and Well, pretty- look, so, like, some policymakers are, are figuring it out. Like their geopolitics will start to play a role here, where it's like you have morons like Brad Sherman just now saying that, oh, China's banning you know, getting rid of the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, we should, we should be out in front of them. Like this guy's a total moron. He's a dinosaur. He's going to ruin his country. Thank God we have smarter politicians who realize the long-term game theory here, which says that America should have as much of the mining infrastructure as possible. We should have as much of the Bitcoin as possible. You know, Bitcoin is much more in line with our values as Americans than it is with, with the Chinese communist party. Like thankfully some politicians are starting to understand this. Uh, we will be, we are much better positioned than the CCP, you know, to benefit um, from from a Bitcoin standard. Much better, much better. Does that mean it's not even close? 
we talked about nation states policies, uh, Bitcoin as a vehicle to freedom, but there's one thing that Bitcoin doesn't have is the arms and guns, and it doesn't have a state. Obviously, the question then arises, will we still see the nation states at that level that we see them today, or will Bitcoin be always like uh, an escape uh, door, but without a real exit, so to say? Because if this, the, the, the system of taxes and, and, and co basically like fiat is um, uh, a coerced, coerced money in a way, right? If you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail, so on and so forth. Like all that is basically something that um, Bitcoin has in terms of, of yeah. freedom, but not in terms I of mean, yeah, physical. It's, it's, not a pan, it's not a panacea, man. I mean, we're still going to live in societies. We're still going to make social contracts. Like you want to live your life. You don't want to build the roads. You want someone else to do that for you. And a lot of times the government's going to step in and do that stuff. Um, but Ultimately, again, I mean, it's just going to give more power to individuals. They're going to have more choice on where to live, where to go. Um, governments are going to have to be nicer to the citizens if, if they want to, to get that money, that Bitcoin. Um, they're going to have to be nice about it and listen carefully. So I think it just is like a new shift. It's going to be a new paradigm. It's You may see like, yeah, like may see like a lapse into smaller communities, like, you know, rather than these big nation states built on drawn with lines from people 100 years ago who are dead i mean you know think about look at africa it's fucking insane all these lines were drawn up by yeah. what europeans 100 years ago like what like it has nothing to do with the on the ground realities um so we're gonna we're gonna become global citizens our money's gonna be in cyberspace um and you know there'll still be nations of course but uh you know the, they that may break down a little bit um but uh, yeah, it may encourage more localism and more more sort of community powered governance. Yeah, very possible. Mm. I think you also wrote like recently you had like um, I think just a, a week ago now um, you had um, a piece written about uh, the monetary um, um, colonialism, right? And this is something that is still present today. I'm I'm French. I'm from France, and it's something that is barely talked about. Um, it is hidden in plain sight. It's basically the tale of how one country, France, is still controlling the monetary uh, um, yeah supply and even policies of 15 other countries in in Africa. Um, how did you first um, uh, come across uh, the, 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 let's say, that um, reality? And uh, what exactly does it entail in terms of, of the, the potential for change, just like Bitcoin as a tool is, uh, for those people in those countries? Right. So, you know, 183 million people live under French monetary colonialism to this day through the CFA system. There are some slight reforms that are happening now and into the future, but they're largely cosmetic and the French will still retain control, especially in the central African nations where there like really are no reforms on the table at all. Um, and it's a very devious system that, that is basically like designed so that like there's dictators uh, in these countries that have this deal with France. So they get like weapons and political cover and diplomatic cover and they get support. And in exchange, they keep running this currency system, which benefits the French. It gives them, uh, you know, cheap imports, raw materials. It gives them a place to sell their finished goods and books and things like that. Um, it's really helped France be the nation it is today and not like a smaller nation like Portugal or Austria, which is really what it could be if it didn't have this colonial enterprise going. Um, so, or, you know, more something like like a Belgium or something. Like that. that that's, that's like the level France would be at if it didn't have the colonies to, to, to sort of milk. Um, I mean, think about it, like 75% of France's energy grid is nuclear. Guess where that uranium comes from? Niger, Chad, etc. at very, very cheap prices, right? Um, and anytime those rulers would try to like make more money off the minerals that they lived, literally, literally, literally governed over, they would get, you know, thrown out in a military coup sponsored by the French or whatever. So to this day, it's a very difficult system to extract from. And what are you going to do if you're in Senegal or Togo? Like wait around for like the government to reform or for the dictator to die or whatever. It's tough. So you can seize the day now and opt into a new currency system that's not controlled by the French or by the local dictator. That's everybody's money, the people's money, user controlled Bitcoin. So this is what they're doing and they're learning about it. And I will be involved in helping them for sure. 
Is there like a current cases? Because in the in the article you wrote about this uh, brilliant 18 year old at that time, so Fodi Diop, um, who's been mm -hmm. basically educating his uh, local community about the use of, of Bitcoin and also Lightning Network and send each other uh, transactions and circumvent that. What were the first benefits of, of real life changing daily um, um, yeah, examples that, that he was able to, um, to yeah, help his or support his community with? Um, I, think it's I mean, remittances, young, right? remittances, dude, it's remittances, like the average remittance to sub-Saharan Africa, $200, 8%, $500, 9%. I mean, you can use send cash today to send, and you know, thousand bucks to Nigeria. In minutes, it'll go into Naira into somebody's bank account. You do it through Bitcoin, Z no fees. Like the old stuff is dinosaur technology. This is life changing for people, like saving six, 10, 15% on transfers uh, of income to families who need it, who earn, depend on it. This is life-changing stuff. And some of these countries have 5, 10, 15, 20, 40% of their GDP is in remittances. Tonga's 40%. El Salvador's 22%. Um, Comoros is 14%. Uh, Senegal is like 10%. Nigeria is like 8%. Philippines, 10%. I mean, huge chunks. We're talking many, many billions, tens of billions of dollars are, are, are sent through remittances and like this chunk is just taken out by the middlemen. We're talking billions of dollars. We're talking uh, globally out of $700 billion in remittances every year, 30 to 40 billion eaten up by fees that could be saved by going to the Bitcoin standard for remittances. That's the same budget as the entire US foreign aid budget. So you want to actually make a difference in the world and help people and empower them and help them save and have a better quality of life. Like, let's go to the Bitcoin standard. So that will be the Bitcoin standard. Uh, El Salvador. It'd be part of it. It'd yeah. be part of it. I mean, the Bitcoin standard is essentially where El Salvador is heading there. I mean, the Bitcoin standard is that your central bank holds reserves in Bitcoin and that that Bitcoin is, you know, legal tender for citizens to use if they wish. Um, and, and that you can basically, you don't have to deal with fiat currency. I mean, some people already live in the fiat in the Bitcoin standard as individuals. You can do it. You can earn in Bitcoin, save in Bitcoin, and spend in Bitcoin either through Bitcoin merchants or through things like BitRefill, where you can buy gift cards, where you can literally buy anything from like Whole Foods to Amazon to your groceries or electricity or mobile phone minutes or gasoline or literally anything that you could possibly imagine. Uh, you could buy through BitRefill or through, through gift cards bought with Bitcoin without any ID, or uh, you can. Let's say you're, you're renting an apartment and your you know, landlord refuses to accept Bitcoin. Great. You just use an exchange, exchange the Bitcoin for fiat, pay them. So today you can, you can be a sovereign Bitcoin individual under a Bitcoin standard. It's just going to be a lot more easy to do in the future. Mm. Um, we've seen many examples, for example, so I, I, um, if we look at the comparison, which is the closest that we have so far is, is gold in a way that it's been basically used as, um, let's say, neutral uh, assets uh, owned by different countries where no country had a direct control over its supply except the basically excavation and mining and so on and so forth. How is, um, mm -hmm. um, in a world, let's say, we project each other like in, in the future of uh, maybe a decade to come where not only Salvador is adopting Bitcoin, but other countries, but then um, another chunk which feels threatened by it, just like China ex expelling uh, miners from its, um, from its country, which actually maybe in, like, in a way is maybe good for Bitcoin because it's uh, um, um, is also a sign of how much Bitcoin is uh, seen as a threat to the CCP itself. Um, but we see a crackdown in terms of uh, all the, the entry points and exit points. So as you said, there's exchanges and there's a whole infrastructure based on that. And we see just like governments uh, were able to seize gold uh, back in the back in the days, just like in, in the 30s uh, in the US, for example, or just uh, even before that, uh, centuries before we have countless examples, the same way that we uh, witness um, a coordinated crackdown on the access on the doors of uh, where Bitcoin comes in and comes out. What and how do you think um, uh, would that result? Is this, for example, from an analogy like cutting like uh, the, the the tentacle of an octopus and growing again, or it would it chop it, its head off? Like how how could we possibly think around that kind of um, well ev kind of event? I mean, when when you, you when you look at China, you have basically this is the civilizational struggle, man. I mean, you have people living in China 
uh, under a digital authoritarian regime, you know, where they are put into camps and sorted and you have social engineering and citizen scores. And I mean, that's, that's the end road. I mean, that's the slippery slope. If we allow governments to centralize power completely, I mean, that's what you're going to get. So you're going to get Muslims in prison camps and that that's the trade-off you make. Oh, you know, government will do its best to make sure that the population is healthy and um, prosperous and all this stuff. It's like, yeah, but like anyone the government doesn't like is going to go to a prison camp. This is like where we're going there. So Bitcoin's our way out. I mean, it's like, a, you know, a, an escape valve from that. And, and it, it's, it's really most powerful because it's not just this like tool for citizens, but it has this Trojan horse uh, mechanism where like governments cannot resist it. Because like at the end of the day, they need the yield, they need to make money, and they need to have a hard currency. You know, the hard currency always wins gold over silver, silver over wampum, um, dollars over uh, pesos, like you're never going to go the other way. It's not like, again, like the Argentine businessman, this is what Michael Saylor says, like, it's not, it's not like the guy in Argentina making his money in America or whatever is going to be like taking dollars off the table to like put back into pesos. No, he's going to keep them all in dollars. Like the hardest money always wins. So, you know, once you realize what's happening, it's not like you're going to be taking your Bitcoin profits and selling them into dollars for what, what are you going to put them into? You know, like the only thing you should be selling your Bitcoin for is to buy real stuff. Like not, not to be investing into real estate or like stocks or, other currencies, like these things are all going to go down in value versus Bitcoin. So like it is the ultimate store of value. And, you know, the only thing you really you should be selling it for is if you need to, 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 per, to like buy things or purchase services, like that's fair. Um, but not as like an alternate, like not as an alternative store of value. Like this thing's going to eat everything else over the coming decades. And, and, and that's why it's so interesting because it, it has this Trojan horse mechanism where governments and corporations are, are being forced to, you're watching this right now, they're being forced to adopt it um, Why for their own self-interested reasons. It's because Bitcoin forces them. It, do, it, it doesn't, it, they are forced to adopt it because it is the best thing for them at the time, strategically. Um, it's like this virus that spreads. I mean, it doesn't have its own guns, as you said, but it, it forces, it'll force the hand of governments. They will, I mean, China's banning Bitcoin now. They're eventually going to have to buy back in later at a higher price, just like everybody else. Um, so it's not just that it's this incredible tool of empowerment. It's also that it's like unstoppable because instead of like attacking it, governments will have to adopt it. So, so that's the really interesting thing here. You see some of these arguments now being raised against Bitcoin. One of them is uh, energy usage, of course. Have you and you've spoken about this before, but I want to, I want to see if I can get a full analysis about this energy use usage. And and you talk about the, um, the the resemblance between Bitcoin and Visa, which is, and I love that term, the full stack. You need to you need to uh, count in the full stack of the dollar system, which comprehends everything up from even, even till uh, onto war to, to defend that system. Is that, is that correct? And could you uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah. When you look at the energy usage of a visa transaction that you make at the grocery store, it's, it's not just the visa network and the visa company and all the visa employees and, uh, it's also the banking system that Visa is based on, um, the hundreds of offices and bureaucrats and employees around the world. And then, um, on top of that is the dollar system where, where, you know, and, and essentially every, all the major international flows of currency still happen through dollars. Um, and the dollar, uh, is, is backed by us foreign policy and the us military, which is the single largest uh, customer and purchaser and user of, of petroleum. Um, and that is held in place through different military arrangements, like the ones we have with Saudi Arabia. And essentially the dollar system is, is premised on this idea of, that I mentioned earlier, where like all energy is priced in dollars. Now, again, this is starting to unravel over the last few years, but that's, that's really where this comes from. So. I mean, the dollar is like really like based on dictators, oil, uh, the Triffin dilemma, which has, has led to, you know, like a hollowing out of our 
of our middle class and, and essentially like moving all of our exports abroad. It's, it's based on that trade-off. Um, and you know, it's also basically, um, you know, based on this like petroleum industry, fossil fuels. So, I mean, you compare that to Bitcoin, which wears everything on its sleeve is totally transparent. Um, we can, we know exactly what's going on with Bitcoin pretty much. I mean, to, to a much closer degree than we do with the dollar system, which is like totally obfuscated and hard to understand. Uh, Bitcoin is a particular hash rate uh, that is fed by different energy sources from around the world. We have like a decent understanding of what that breakdown is. And in the future, that'll be very, very green. I mean, like renewable technology is getting cheaper, man. I mean, wind, solar, I mean, that stuff's getting so cheap compared to what it was 10 years ago. It'll continue to get cheaper. It'll continue to get cheaper. Um, hydro, geothermal, tons of this stuff's going to be unlocked uh, in the developing world over the coming decade. That, that doesn't make sense now. I mean, think about it this way. If you're a country in Central America that has volcanoes and you have the stranded geothermal energy, you'll be able to sell bonds based on future untapped geothermal energy because people can come in and do Bitcoin mining. Not possible before Bitcoin. So if you're like Panama, what would you rather do? Raise money from foreign investors based on your future Bitcoin mining potential or take out a loan from the IMF and be a slave to their policies? So no brainer for me, man. So you, you, you're going to see a lot more of that hopefully in the future. Mm. Do you still do you still see a role uh, for gold? Because just now you said gold will be eaten up by by Bitcoin. Is there a role, maybe coexistence for gold and Bitcoin? Um, I mean, not really. I mean, uh, gold gold will be useful uh, for its industrial use. I mean, it has lots of industrial and cosmetic uses. But even its cosmetic uses will be less valuable in the future once it's no longer a store, of, uh, you know, seen as widely like as a store of value. Like essentially, it's going to become kind of like copper over time. It'll take a long time to lose that luster that it has. Mm -hmm. But once people shift over to Bitcoin and they realize that it, Bitcoin is everything gold can be, but way better, it's teleportable. Um, you know, it, it 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 doesn't have to sink to the bottom of the sea. Uh, you know, you can like split it up and arrange custody so that it's like a split between different parties. Um, I mean, dude, it's programmable. It's mathematic. Like it, 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 it has a better stock to flow ratio. It's more scarce. I mean, we don't have to worry about a space asteroid. Like we know what's going on with Bitcoin. So I think it's going to lose all pretty much all of its store value value. And then on top of that, it'll probably also lose some of its cosmetic value. It'll keep its industrial value. But I think that's like one tenth of what it what it has or something like that. So I mean, maybe gold will be worth like a trillion in the future. I mean, Bitcoin has already hit a trillion a couple months ago, right? So Bitcoin ceiling is way higher than golds, way higher than golds. So just think about that. All right, Alex. I think we are approaching uh, the end of uh, of our of our time. Unfortunately, uh, just as gold and and Bitcoin, uh, your time is also precious and limited. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you a lot. Uh, if you if you um, would uh, synthesize this conversation we had uh, in one tweet, what would that be? Bitcoin is the future. <laughs> All right, lazy but That's go it, on. Man. <laughs> It's true. I, I I have one more. I've I've actually I have one more short question. Do you think sure. bit, because you you said about gold that it has a it, this this it's been around for eons. Do you think mm -hmm. we we will will still use Bitcoin in whatever form uh, it might be in in let's say a thousand years? Hard to say. Um, It's possible. Uh, I think we're trying to build Bitcoin as a as a as a thousand year project. Yes, and that's why it's like so hard to change, and, and that we're so careful about it, and that's why it's not a move fast and break things thing like every other cryptocurrency. Like everything is very carefully done um, because we're trying to set up a currency for the next thousand years. Yeah, I mean, the only risk long term that I can really see is interplanetary i mean basically bitcoin mining can really only take place on on just due to the speed of light and stuff like it can really only take place on one planet so if mars started you can you could use bitcoin on mars like you can use lightning totally fine but um 
the Bitcoin mining couldn't, you wouldn't be able to mine on Mars. Like basically the center of hash is too close to, to the Earth's core. So, um, so that'll like basically restrict Bitcoin to, to being quite kind of centered around the Earth. Um, so like maybe in the far future, uh, and there's some good writing on this by a um, guy who works at Unchained Capital, Dhruv Bansal, I think, has done some pieces on this. It's possible that like the Martians, instead of like being slaves to the Earth, they'll maybe start their own version of Bitcoin or something like that. And then same thing in other galaxies. We'll see. But that that's the only thing I can think of like long term that would really threaten like the, the, the Bitcoin that we know here. I don't think anything else can really threaten it. Uh, we should uh, invite uh, Elon, Elon for that conversation. That's uh, that's his wet dream, of course. Uh, and he might have thought about it already. He might be trolling well, Martians, around. No, Martians will use Bitcoin. It's fine. It's just they can't really mine it competitively. I mean, that's really the only downside. Yeah. And and um, uh, Elon have, have, might have been trolling around for this whole time, but maybe he's uh, he's already preparing under the hood uh, uh, his own uh, interplanetary uh, uh, Doge uh, currency um, in one way or another. Whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're still bitter about it, right? Are you, are you also part of that clan that is no, totally to the point Elon, of No, Elon's great, man. He bought a billion dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah, great. Exactly. I mean, I think he gets it. I think he's being forced into walking it back by his company. But yeah. I'm pretty sure Elon knows what's going on. So um, anyway, yeah, it's been fun talking to you, gents. We'll see you around. All yeah. right, man. Thanks Thank you lot. very much.